Shabbat Shalom, Yasharala. I did a shofar blast before the I started this recording, but we're going to do it one more time again. Even if you can't hear it and you're watching this later, blow your shofar or give a shout of praise for our creator because we are in the midst of the week of unleavened bread and let's give him praise. All right. This is a line-by-line -line reading of the book of James from the Hebrew translation, from Hebrew manuscript. A lot of people believe that the entirety of the New Testament originally was written in Greek, and due to the due diligence of biblical scholars and you know those that search for the truth, they have found manuscripts that was actually written in uh, he Hebrew, and that's what we are reading from today. And we'll see that the words peel off the page just that much more better when we're reading from the Hebrew. But before we continue, y'all know the deal. Let's give Abba his praise and ask for him to lead this reading. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we submit our entirety, our flesh, our soul, our spirit to your kingdom. We ask that you use us as vessels, that we don't seek to do our own will, but we ask you that our will is what you want for us. We ask that anything that we are desiring that is not of your kingdom, that you show us and we, we have eyes to see that we need to push it away and that you give us the strength to do so. In these times, Heavenly Father, we ask for endurance and we ask for discernment to push away any one and any doctrine and any sin that is within our beings. Separate us from the darkness of this world because you are light and we want to walk in the light of the only begotten Son. We thank you. We ask that you have the Ruach Kodesh guide this message through each and every being that is seeking you, Heavenly Father. Show mercy upon your people and heal us. In the name of the Son, Yeshaya, Amen. Let's do this. All right, the book of James, or Yaakov. His actual Hebrew name is Yaakov, if you didn't know. So if we were translating it from the Hebrew name, it would be the book of Jacob. <laughs> Don't ask me why he's been given the English name James. There's a lot of things that we've been given in English that just doesn't make sense. But moving forward, I put the book of James for the title so people could understand what book it is. But out of respect for who he actually is and the name he has, the remaining of this study, I will be calling him Jacob or Yaakov. All right? But once again, it's the same thing as the book of James. In the introduction, before we get started on a line-by-line -line reading from the Hebrew translation, we're going to go over who this James is. There is, you know, multiple James, and I believe that's the thing about it. There is two different James apostles, and then you have the James that is the Messiah's brother. And I just showed you, or I just told you that his name should actually be Jacob. I feel like the only reason his name is James is to give us confusion on who the James we're talking about since they give so many of these Israelites the same name in English. But either way, let's look into the details and see who we are about to read from. So we see the dynasty the of Messiah. Messiah is actually related to a lot of his disciples, if you didn't know. 
one way or another. We see James and Jude, both disciples, and James and John here are both disciples in Messiah's family tree from uh, Joseph being related to Cleophas. They are brothers, and Cleophas, this is his children or his children's children. All right, but not to go into all of that, we're going to focus on the James. And so, like I said, we see James with the nickname the lesser, James the greater, and then James the just. And I, I'm just going to hear and tell you that I'm going to show you from my understanding, understanding that we will be reading from James the just, the brother of Messiah and not one of the disciples. So let's look into that in the details of the scriptures. Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James? As we see there. So just pointing out that they're James the brother. John 7, 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. And I just wanted to, to show you that. That just makes this that much more extraordinary that during the time Messiah was alive, James and his brethren questioned his divinity. But something changed. Okay, okay, let me see. Okay, I'll read this in order. I, I thought there was another slide next, but excuse me. Something changed that has the Messiah's brother leading the church of the Nazarenes, as we see in Acts 15 here. And after they had held their peace, so this was right after Peter spoke. So the, the lead apostle spoke. Then out of, and, and just to put the scene here, this is at the Jerusalem Council. This is all the high-ranking apostles, elders of the church are all present here. And only two people spoke, Peter and James. And I'm going to show you exactly because uh, later in um, Paul's letters, he makes it clear that this is the brother of Messiah. And James answers saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon has declared how Elohim at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and etc. I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'll just put it here for con uh, your context if you want to see what he says. But he is informing the people and giving instructions because he is a leader. And then we see in Galatians chapter 2 and 9, when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, these were the pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John. So now we see that there is a James, and even he even named James before Peter. The order matters that James is a leader amongst the elders in Jerusalem and the apostles. So now let's dissect exactly which James is this. Galatians 1 19. But other of but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Adon's brother. Because James is a lead of the elders of the church. And then looking more into that, why would he go to James, Messiah's brother? Acts 21, 18, in the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Once again, at the Jerusalem council, this is the time, this is what he's saying. He went to James, the Messiah's brother, when he would go to the Jerusalem council. This is the same exact James. Acts 12, now just uh, showing that it can't be this James, we're going to see that we can already disqualify 
because he's not alive at this time. James the Greater, the brother of John, dies in Acts 12. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Adon had brought him out of the prison. He said, go show these things unto James, because James is the lead elder of the church of the Nazarenes, and to the brethren, James and the elders, James and the elders. James amongst the elders, it's the same person, very consistent here. Continuing, Acts 10. Him, Allah, he raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before Allah, he. Even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And um, this is uh, Peter speaking here in Acts 10. So I touched on this in the very beginning that they didn't believe in Messiah while he was here, but this is what changed. James was approached after the resurrection of the Messiah. He was one of the chosen witnesses and it changed his life forevermore. And we see that this is confirmed in 1 Corinthians 15. In that he was seen by Cephas or Cleophas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James. This is what changed everything for James. Then of all the apostles. So we see that. This also, in this context, in 1 Corinthians, this is not speaking of neither of these James. Because he makes it clear that he was seen from James, then of the apostles. Not James of one of the apostles. James, the brother of Messiah, then he went and saw all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me. And this is obviously Paul speaking here. And then we see the story of what 1 Corinthians is speaking of that he went and saw Cephas or Cleophas here and James in Luke 24. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus. I know I butchered it. Continuing, which was from Jerusalem about three score foot long, foot longs, and they talked together of all things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Yeshaya himself drew near and went with, went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these things, these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleophas, Answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. So the eleven obviously are the eleven apostles, because at this time there was only eleven. Obviously Judas was not amongst them, and um, he was deceased also at this time, and Matthias was not an ordained apostle yet. So this is... The conclusion of the matter. And we also see an epistle from Clement to James. James is called the Bishop of Bishops who rules Jerusalem, the Holy Church of the Hebrews. This is the position of James. And this makes so much sense that James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. 
let me explain it. Oh, yeah. And just to put in context, we see Clement was a brother that was associated with Paul, which is why we see in real time that he would also be talking to James and was amongst them at that time. But for me, it makes so much sense why James not being an apostle would be called to be the leader of the church because James was a witness, even though he wasn't a believer in real time, he was a witness of his brother and whatever was spoken to him, it mattered. But I was saying the difference between him being a leader of the church in Jerusalem and not one of the apostles because apostle literally means to be sent out. Just like what Paul, Paul and we, we see Peter go out to Cornelius. They are told to be sent out to the lost sheep of Israel and to the Gentiles. But the leader of the church needs to stay in the church. The leader has to be there for those that are coming and seeking counsel. How can Peter or one of the apostles lead the church in Jerusalem at all times if they're being sent out as they were trained to do throughout the Gospels? The apostles were called to be sent out to spread the message. And James, not being an apostle, were called to be the bishop of bishops who rules Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem amongst the elders. Someone had to stay firm to run the church, obviously. All right. And that is our introduction to the book of Yaakov. And this is the brother of Mashiach. All that being said, let's begin the reading from the Hebrew manuscript of the book of Yaakov. And if you want to re read along, now or later, Look up at the top here. Simply type in HebrewGospels.com and go to the, it will have the Gospels that are in translated in Hebrew there. Then they'll have others from the New Testament. They have the book of Revelation, the book of Jude, and the book of Yaakov, James. Click that and you'll have the translation right there for you. All right. Yes, and they also have an app as well. Yes, download that app. Make notes. Don't forget, save the website to your browser. Download the app. All right, that being said, let us read. Chapter 1, verse 1. Yaakov, or James, a servant of Hayah and Adon Yeshaya Hamashiach to the 12 tribes, which are scattered into all the places. Firstly, joy, my beloved brothers. Consider it as joy when you fall into a trial. Listen up, Yasharala. This is for everyone right now. Many of us are in trial. We are in testing. I'm going to say it one more again. Consider it as joy when you fall into a trial and know that your faith, when it is complete, makes long suffering. But the long suffering must be unto the end so that you may be with fullness and nothing be lacking from you. Our testing has a purpose. Stop complaining. And just give Abba joy and ask him, what's the purpose of this trial? What do, what do you want me to see? How do you want me to grow? Instead of asking to, for it to just to be over. Ask, what do you want from me in this time? Show me, Father. What is your will for me? Verse 5. But if there is one among you who lacks wisdom... He must pray for it from Haya, who gives to every man, and he himself will also give it to him. 
but he must pray in faith and not in doubting. For whosoever is doubtful, he is like a pair of balances on the sea. And this man must not think that he will receive anything from Ha Adon, and he who is doubtful is without knowledge in all his ways. We have to have faith. We have to have it, Yasharala. Verse 9. But a brother who is low is able to boast with his exaltation, while the rich one must boast with his lowness, for like the flower of the field will dry up or wither. And like a flower who comes out, then withers, and he runs away like a shadow and does not remain standing. So this is clearly just speaking of the beauty of this life will not last. Only boast in the exaltation of our father in the kingdom. Money and flowers, the beauty of this life is temporary. It's nothing to boast about. Verse 12, and blessed is the man whom Allahim chastens. So do not refuse the discipline of the Most High Shaddai. For after the chastisement, uh, you will receive the crown of life, which Haya promised to those who love him. We want to be corrected. We want to be disciplined. That shows that he loves us because he is shaping us to be like him. Do not shy away from these trials. Find what he wants from you during these trials and do it with joy. And I say in that, like it's, not, like it's easy, and I'm not trying to say it's easy, but I'm telling you what has to be done for self-growth to happen in the Ruach. Verse 13. But let no one say when a temptation comes on him, this comes from the most high Hayah. For Hayah does not tempt man with evil, and he is not tempted by anyone. Only everyone is tempted when his desire overcomes him. And afterwards, if he accepts the desire, it causes the sin. But the sin when it is completed, causes the death. Let's touch on that. The most high, the most high does not cause you to sin. He doesn't put evil in front of you. He gives you over to your desire. Second Thessalonians 2. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, Allahim shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And when does he send them the delusion? It's after. They chose not to receive the truth. That's when he says it to him. He gives you over to your desires because you literally ask for it by desiring it. And yes, it says, and afterwards in verse 15, if he accepts the desire, it causes the sin, but the sin, when it is completed, causes death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Yeshaya HaMashiach, our Adon. All right, verse 16. Do not go astray, beloved brothers. 
Every good gift comes from above, from the light of the Father, and with him there is no change, nor alteration of light and darkness. And he was shown to us according to his will by the word of truth, so that we can be first fruits of his creation. And we 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 know that the Father. Oh, I forgot to put this verse here. Forgot one second. Let me put it in there. We know that the Father has no darkness in him, which is why he divided light from darkness from the very beginning, and he called the light good. And remember what Mashiach said? Who is good? Only the Father in heaven is good. 1 John 1, 5. Then, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you, that Allahim is light. And in him is no darkness at all, which is why we don't celebrate darkness. We don't celebrate dark moons. We celebrate fully lit moons. And he does not change. And he has divided light from darkness. So we will never celebrate darkness. And we will never celebrate something that is half light, half dark. <laughs> And then, uh, yes, verse 18, and he had was shown to us according to his will by the word of the truth so that we can be first fruits of his creation, which is what we are called to be and what this life is about. As we read in Revelation 14, 4, these are they which are not defiled with women. For they are virgins. This is you doing abominations of the world, the land, the people of the nations. These are they which follow the Lamb with ever he goeth. These are were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto Allahim and to the Lamb. Verse 19, because of this, beloved brothers, all the sons of man must be quick to listen, but not to speak and not to anger. I tell y'all what, I, I turned off my comments, it's not a secret. I turned off my comments on Instagram and TikTok because this verse right here, people don't keep. People don't keep this verse. <laughs> I'm just being 100. The, uh, the book of Proverbs talks about this many different uh, times in the book of Proverbs that fools speak before they study. I should have added that verse in here, that the fools speak before they study. We must be quick to listen, but not to speak and not to anger. Verse 20. For the anger of the sons of man does not do that which is good before Hayah. But you must be of those who do the word and not of those who hear only, by which they deceive you. For if one is he who hears the word but does not do it, he is like a man who sees himself in the mirrors of the serving woman women for after he saw himself he goes away from it and forgets what he saw but whosoever sees with fullness into the law of joy and if we look in the masoretic translation or manuscript let's go to what's this verse 24 or 25 They have it as the law of liberty. The law of liberty. Law of joy is consistent with scripture. 
David speaks of this all throughout the Psalms, that his law and his Torah is joyful. It gives joy to us. So the fullness into the law of joy and establishes it and does not forget what he heard, but does it. This one will be blessed in all his deeds. However, if one among you thinks by himself that he serves Haya, but does not keep his tongue with a brittle, but deceives his heart. This service of Haya is not good, but the pure service without lack before the Most High, the Father, is this. He who goes to visit the fatherless ones and the widows in their distresses. And putting this into perspective here. Why does it say the fatherless ones and the widows? Because these are those that do not have a cover. It doesn't mention a man. It mentions children and women that do not have a husband. Just putting it in perspective. This is why it says the orphan, which is probably what it translates here. Yep. Visit the orphan and widows because we should look out for those that do not have a cover. This is a commandment. And that is the completion of chapter one from the book of Yaakov. All right. Oh, I love this book. I love the book of James. One of my favorite books. It's so straightforward and still simply poetic. All right. Chapter two, verse one. Beloved brothers, do not think the faith in Yeshaya HaMashiach, our Adon, respects persons. For when one arrives at the, the house of judgment with a golden ring and with lovely clothes, and also a poor one with worthless, worthless clothes, and you show respect to him who wears the lovely clothes, and say to him, sit by us on this good seat. And say to the poor, stand there or sit at our feet. Then they will not look justly on this poor one, but you will be judges who make a bad division. And this is, um, who got that scripture for me? First spoken in Deuteronomy, that the Most High is not a respecter of persons. He is not going to judge you based on your wealth especially worldly wealth. Somebody hit me, give me that scripture when you can um, in the chat. Continuing. Listen to me, beloved brothers. Did not Hayah choose the poor ones in this world who are rich in faith and possessors of the promise which he promised to those who love him? But you, you put the poor to shame as for the rich ones. It is not they who do everything to you with force and bring you out to the judgment? And do they not reproach and blaspheme the good name of he whom you yourselves call upon and that's so true we are trained to look up to celebrities rich wealthy people but they're the ones oppressing us <laughs> they don't care about us but if if they're in your presence what do you do you will do more for them than somebody else that's poorly in this life And 
Thank you, Stephanie Akholti. As first said in Deuteronomy 17, as James is speaking from at the beginning of this chapter 2, for the Most High, our Allahim, is the Allahim of Allahims, a dawn of lords. He is the great, most high, the mighty and awesome who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. This is spoken throughout the scriptures. As uh, John says also in Romans 2.11, it's all throughout scripture, no respecters of persons. And that's what we need to walk in each and every day. All right, continuing. If you perform the law as it is written in the Torah, but you must love your fellow as yourself, you do good. But if you have respect to man, you do sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For if one establishes the whole Torah, all of it, but sins against one command, he is guilty of the whole. For he who said, you must not commit adultery. He also said, you must not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you transgress the law. Because of this, you must speak and do as those who will be judged by the law with joy. But severe judgment will come on him who did not perform mercy for the mercy boast against the judgment. This is what we're being called to do. Do not try to boast or say, oh, oh, because I'm telling you, I know I I speak to many people in this walk. We try to justify our actions, but say, oh, oh, well, but I'm not eating pork. I'm not doing this. I just can't do this, though. I, I have to break the Sabbath or I, I have to do whatever. I, I sinned. I, I broke this commandment, but I'm doing all of these. You can't do that. This is what this is saying. You cannot pick and choose and try to say these works will outweigh this sin when you knowingly sin. That's the biggest crime of man. When because there's levels to this. That's the the idea of grace. You have more mercy when you are coming to uh, the truth or you just don't have understanding of it and you're sinning. But when you have understanding, there's, there's no mercy there, y'all. We, we there's, there's levels to this and there's no mercy when you choose the sin knowingly and then you try to rationalize it with the most high saying but i'm doing all of this the most high does not care he doesn't I, you know he, he, he's not he's it's not a debate do y'all think on judgment day you're gonna be able to uh, give a petition and be like well father hold on let's count my good works according to my sins and i've done way more good works you're not gonna be able to do that you're gonna be too busy bawling and, and falling on the ground Submitting in every way. And yes, let me read that one one more time. This is another one. Uh, this is actually the specific one I was thinking of in Deuteronomy. Thank you, Danny. Deuteronomy 117, on the respect of a person. I just want to say it out loud because I didn't have this. For some reason, sometimes I don't have all the, the scriptures I should have had. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of a man. And that's what we're saying right now in verse 9.
But if you have respect to, to man, you do sin. This is what exactly he's speaking of. He is speaking exactly from Deuteronomy. Like I said, still reading the rest of Deuteronomy 17 here. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is Allahim's and the cause that is too hard for you. Bring it unto me and I will hear it. Because Abba ain't going to play these games. And I see even more scripture on the same topic. We know this is what scripture does. It's precept upon precept. It's very consistent. I love it. All right. Continuing now. Let me see. Where am I? I'll, I'll just uh, continue in verse 11. For he who said you must not commit adultery... He also said you must not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you transgress the law. But of this, you must speak and do as those who will be judged by the law with joy. But severe judgment. You hear this, y'all? Severe judgment will come on him who do not perform mercy for the mercy boasts against the judgment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And show mercy as Abba shows mercy to us. People have opportunity to repent every day. Let's not condemn them. Let's judge righteously. And judging righteously is showing them their, that their sins so they can change. Unrighteous judgment is condemning them and saying, you're going to hell without saying, hey, hey, brother, hey, sister. Just letting you know, in this chapter and verse, always bring chapter and verse. This is what this says. Just letting you know that I'm pretty sure this is not of Abba. And don't condemn them. Every single one of us came to the truth at different times. And every single one of us has heard a portion of the truth that you wasn't ready for when it was first spoken to you. It took a little bit of time. It could have only took a day. It could have took a week. It could have took a year. Don't condemn them to hell. Show them that and allow the Ruach to work the way the Ruach works. I have spoken to many people. And I, I straight up, Geo, <laughs> just to say it, I, I saw Geo in person for the first time a couple weeks ago. He came to be baptized. And when I was speaking to him and he, uh, and he started coming to the lives and started actually uh, grabbing a hold of the Torah and he would DM me and I realized in our DM history, I hope you don't mind me doing this, Gio, but you know, it's all love. Just as an example, I realized I, I, Gio has been messaging me for the last two years, for the last two years, but he didn't take a hold of the covenant until the last like, what was it? Six to eight months per se. And Abba has still embraced him. He is still grabbing a hold and he is bringing other brothers and spreading the message and doing good works to the kingdom right now in real time. That's just one example of what many of us are called to do. Don't place judgment. Answer questions, be a light, and allow the Ruach to work out his salvation with fear and trembling. And now he is doing the work of the kingdom and it was in Abba's time and in his time. <laughs> Shout out to my brother Gio. <laughs> and that's how it works. That's how it works though. All right. Verse 14. And what profit is there, beloved brothers, if one says that he has the faith, but he does not have the works? For this faith does not have the ability to sanctify him. 
For if there is a brother or sister who lacks to sustain themselves every day, and one of you speak words of comfort to them, may Haya give you to gratification, but he does not give them anything to profit the body. What profit will they have by these words? So the faith, if it does not have the works, is dead by itself. And so um, it's, this is actually a little bit harder to understand from this translation here. But what James is saying here, as an example of your works describing your faith, He's saying, for if a brother or sister who lacks to sustain themselves every day, this is speaking about like they lack food, they lack warmth, comfort, things that we need in this life, not, not talking about spiritual things, we're talking about food that we need in this life. And one speaks words of comfort and saying, may Abba give you gratification but he does not give them anything to profit the body. What profit will they have by these words? If you see a homeless person, this is the example he's given of your work should describe your faith. If you see a homeless person and you say, may Abba bless you, when you have money in your pocket, food available, and they're hungry, and you just say, well, I'm not going to give you any food, but may Abba send you some food. You're the one that's supposed to be sent from Abba to nourish them with food. That's a righteous work. This is what we're called to do, right? To take care of the orphan and the widows. So if we go to an orphan and a widow and we go just say, may Abba bless you. You're not doing what you're commanded to do. Abba, you're supposed to be the one that blesses him through Abba. We are the messengers that's supposed to be doing the will of Abba. We're supposed to be doing it. So the faith, if it does not have the works, is dead by itself. Truly, one is able to say, you have the faith, but I have the works. Bear me witness of your faith with your works. I am also bearing witness to you of my faith, for I have works. Love it, Yaakov. You, you believe that Haya is one. You do well. The Satans also believe so. And they tremble. But you do, but do you want to know that the faith without works is dead? Was not our father Abraham justified by his works when he brought his son as an offering on the altar? And by this, you yourself are able to see that the faith worked with his works. And by the works, the faith was made complete. And uh, before I go to a whole page, even though this continues, I just want to touch on this. We see that in Genesis 15, 6, that it says that he believed the Most High and he counted it to him for righteousness. But that righteousness was confirmed as James speaks of, it was justified and confirmed by his words. And this is, speaking of when Paul brings it up in Romans, which the church just runs with the lawlessness. Paul is speaking of it in the context that the journey of Abraham started with faith. And James is speaking of the context of saying that Abraham's faith was confirmed by his works. But in Romans, the beginning of the journey starts with faith. 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before Elohim. For what says the scripture, Abraham believed Elohim, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. The biggest difference, we always got to understand, when Paul is speaking super hyper faith and grace, he is speaking of the beginning of our journey. James is saying, as we walk in this journey, show your works to display your faith. All right. And by this, the Torah was fulfilled, which is said, and Abraham believed in Haya, it was reckoned to him as righteousness, as we read, just read in Genesis 15, 6. And now, you are able to see that man is justified by the works and not only by the faith. And like this, Rahab the harlot, was she not justified by the works when she received the spies and hid them? And just as a reference, just as a reference, that's uh, Joshua 6.25 speaks on this, uh, Rahab, the harlot alive in her father's household and all she had. And she dwelled in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers in Jericho. For as the body without Ruach is dead. So the faith without works is dead. Thank you for making that crystal clear for every reader that chooses to read the book of James. It's because uh, we all know the church does. I have never, and I, I mean, I've been in many churches growing up and I tell y'all, I never remember them reading ever the book of James. And, uh, Rightfully so. As we read it, it's too clear that we should be keeping some laws, right? <laughs> All the laws, right? All right. And that is chapter two of the book of Yaakov. All right. Chapter three of five. Beloved brothers, not every one of you must be an expert teacher and know that the punishment will be greater. Oh boy, this is so relevant in the time that we're in. <laughs> I say this over and over again, and I say this humbly, that... Do you really want to be judged harshly for misguiding his people? Yes, I choose to take this upon myself. I choose to be judged more harshly than just anybody in the truth. There's levels to everything in this life. There's levels to the kingdom and there's levels of judgment, just how I was saying that your judgment is more harsh when you know the Torah and break a commandment to someone that doesn't know the Torah and breaks the, the, the commandment. There's levels of judgment, and we see another level for those that choose to teach. So if you choose to teach, buckle up, because it's not for the faint-hearted. Not only will you be judged more harshly from Abba, but you will be ran through the mud from your brothers and sisters of the truth that don't agree with you. So take it in stride and um, 
understand what you're getting yourself into. And, and, and might I add, when you look, when you look in the Bible, you can count, most likely you can count on your fingers how many true teachers are in each time and, uh, from uh, the prophets and the kings, times of the kings, to the time of Exodus with Moses and Aaron, to at any given time. It wasn't a lot of teachers ever, but in our time, there are very, very, very many. That's got to tell you something. Something's not consistent. There's nothing new under the sun, y'all. There's never going to be 100,000 teachers. It's, it's never going to be like that, ever. But I'm not going to single out anyone. Everybody has their own path. And who am I to say what you've been called to do? That's between you and the Father. All right, verse 2. For we sin in many words. But he who does not sin in any word, he is a set-apart man and able to bridle the whole body. And look, we lead the horses with a bridle to lead them according to our will. And also the ships, although they are great and go by the force, by the force of the wind, yet they are guided by a small rudder, which is in the hand of the messenger. The point is, is that you can guide a massive ship with a little rudder. We're about to go into the power of the tongue. This is what he's saying. Just by the power of the tongue, Metaphorically, a small rudder, you can guide in a massive ship or a massive of people. We have to watch out what comes from our mouths because you could condemn an entire people from your words that will be displayed through the actions that they will do from what you teach them. So the tongue is a small member. It makes great words. Look, a small fire kindles a great forest. So also the tongue is like an eternal fire, full of iniquity. So it so is the tongue among our members, and it causes the whole body to sin. It kindles us in our walk. If it is kindled from... Uh, this place, I, I I kid you not, I'm horrible at pronouncing this stuff. Bear with me. Y'all know the deal. But this is um, Sheol, uh, uh, hell um, is what that is. And uh, let me see. This is three. Let's see what's translated here in the, what's this, verse six? Yeah, translated as hell in uh, the Masoretic. All right, and uh, before I continue, just going to go ahead and touch on this precept in Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Oh, what we speak, and most importantly, what we teach, and understand Every single person has power of the tongue, even if you're not a teacher with a platform. You still are teaching family members, your children, your wife, uh, another sister that has questions. We all have power in our tongue. 
we just may be at different levels and have different uh, size groups or individuals that are listening. But we all will be judged for what we speak and give instructions on how we walk. We all will be. I guarantee every single one of us has told someone about how to live righteously to what they have been told. But is it what the word says? Are you reading from a chapter and a verse from scriptures that you have read with understanding and knowledge? If you haven't and you don't have a chapter and verse to any instruction, you're in trouble with Abba. Guarantee it. All right. Let's continue. Verse seven. For the nature of all the animals and the birds and the serpents, which are on the dry land or in the sea is like the nature of man. Mark of the beast study. We see that. The mark of the beast study. And just even going into <laughs> um, the occult with Aleister Crowley. This is why his nickname is 666 the beast. Why is his nickname 666 the beast? Is he the actual beast of the scripture? No. He calls himself that because he is about the nature of a man. What comes natural to a man is what's natural to a beast. That's what the mark of the beast symbolizes. Those that do what thou wilt, which is the whole order of the law for those that are in the world. But the tongue, no man is able to bridle for it is evil and is full of the poison of death. With the tongue, we praise Hayah the father and with it, we curse the man who is in the image of Allahim. Oof. Man, this is fire. Let me say that again. With the same tongue that we bless the Father, we curse the man that is made in the image of the Father. From one mouth there comes out praise and curses. But it must not be so, beloved brethren. For is there indeed a fountain which has in it salt and sweet water? Or is a tree of dates able to give oil or a vine figs? So the fountain is not able to give salt and sweet water. We need to pick a side, Yasharala. We have to pick a side. We can't serve two masters. Whosoever is wise and understanding among you, let him show me his good, good walk with wisdom. But if there be jealousy and hatred in your hearts, do not boast and do not lie against the truth. For this is not wisdom that comes from above, but from the earth, from the man and from the Satan's. For in whosoever there is jealousy and hatred in him, there are many evil things. Woo! Let me tell y'all. Let me tell y'all. Let me tell y'all. I have witnessed multiple people that either has hate for someone in this walk or gets jealous for someone in this walk. And then they become dumb. And why do I say they become dumb? Because they literally become dumb. Because the Ruach is removed. The Ruach Kodesh, I should say. Because uh, 
It sounds like they inherit a Ruach, but it's not the Ruach Quod, that's the Holy Spirit. When you are taken over by jealousy and hatred, and your and your walk is now to just just talk crap about somebody publicly and to and to be negative publicly and to speak against somebody else, they become dumb and spiritless because Abba cannot house that man. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, Yasharala. It's real. Very real. But the wisdom from above is firstly pure and afterwards shalom, peace. And with rest and is able to reconcile and quick to listen and full of mercy. And lastly, it is to goodness and not to partiality or flattery. But the righteous fruits are sown in shalom, peace, by those who establish the shalom, peace. What did, what did I just say, man? What did I just say? Those that are openly causing discord, division, hate, like they want, they, they're promoting for people to hate on certain people openly. There's, there's no room for that in the kingdom. Righteous fruits are sown with peace. I, I've said this <laughs> multiple studies, and I know I can be repetitive at times, but I want to say it for each study that it comes up that it um, is in the category of this topic that brothers and sisters that are telling people to keep the commandments with faith in Messiah do not openly condemn as we spoke on this in the last chapter. Don't act like you're the, the end all in the judge. You very well could be speaking a false doctrine of something that you're teaching, but you think like you're above everyone and now you can talk down to everyone because, oh, I'm not on Saturday Sabbath anymore, so I'm going to straight up dog and diss this ministry. And you don't know what Abba has in store for this brother. This brother may in a year be wiser and greater than you. Because he's walking, seeking truth. He just hasn't found it yet. But he's going to surpass you and he's going to become greater than you because his Ruach is pure. And you're too busy hating on him and you will be downgraded in the kingdom because of it. And I'm telling you, I've seen it with my own eyes. It happened in real time. Watch yourself. And, and, and stop elevating and thinking that you got it all figured out, that you're the wise man of this generation and that you don't need correction. You don't need to be sharpened. And you're over here condemning and judging people when Abba has told you to not cause division amongst brethren that are not against the kingdom. His disciples said, we saw other people casting out uh, brothers in your name, casting out demons in your name. What should we do? And he said, if they're not against us, they're for us. Don't think that you're the only one sent from Abba. Don't think you're the only one that has understanding. Do not think that you are greater than someone because you got here first. You could fall just as fast as Solomon fell. Right into idolatry. I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest things, y'all, that irks me in this walk is when brothers call discord because they think they know everything. Everybody's all like, I'm a warrior. 
I'm a warrior. Abba wants warriors. Abba ain't coming for the warriors. He's coming for the meek. The meek are spiritual warriors, not he-man, loud, talking over folks, thinking they know everything, warriors. He wants righteous spiritual warriors. And those warriors could be soft-spoken. They could be meek. They could be quiet because they rarely talk because they're too busy listening and studying. But everyone hears you because you are loud and saying you're the most righteous warrior of them all. And I guarantee you, those are the ones that are not, that will be humbled and will be made low, below the meek that will inherit the kingdom. All right, <laughs> that's the completion of chapter three of the book of Yaakov. Chapter four. And why is there war among you? Is it not because of your desires, which fight in your members? Woo! Let's go, James. Let's go, Yaakov. So you desire, but you do not receive. And he who takes revenge and stays angry does not profit by it. And why all this? Because you do not pray. And when you do a prayer, it is not answered because you pray wrongly. I said this earlier in this reading. Pray for the right reasons. Or you won't be answered. Oh, adul adulterer and adulteress, you, do you not know that whosoever loves this world, he hates Haya, our Heavenly Father? So whosoever wants to be a lover of this world, he himself will be a hater of the Most High. Or do you think that the Torah says in vain that the spirit which dwells inside you, it covets against the commandments of Allahim, Haya. And before I continue, let's go to the words of our Mashiach. Yeah, here we go. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve Allahim and Mammon, the world. Verse 6. Yet he gives such steadfast love, for the Torah says that Haya exhausts the humble ones. And humiliates the proud. You see, man, the book of J's, man, I love this book. <laughs> Abba will exalt the humble ones. The meek will inherit the earth. Therefore, you must be humble before Haya and fight against the Satans. They will flee away from you if you bring yourselves near to our heavenly father, Haya, he himself will draw near to you. So cleanse your hands, O sinners, and make your hearts pure. And bear your burdens and weep, and let your laughter be turned to weeping, and your joy to grief. Humble yourselves before Haya. He himself will hear you. And so from the beginning of this chapter, he's saying we're, uh, we are praying wrongly. If we are praying with pride and for self-gain, to be exalted above others and to be the wise person for the wrong reasons or for whatever reasons. When people think that the Father has blessed you with worldly possessions that only elevates you worldly in worldliness, that's not the Father that's blessing you. That is... Satan, 
He's giving you worldly things so you can continue to walk as your father, Satan, is commanding you to walk in worldly possessions in pride. Verse 11, beloved brothers, do not go about slandering among yourselves for whosoever goes about as a slanderer against his brother is a slanderer against the law. And if you do so, you do not establish the law. If there is only one who gives the law, who is able to punish and to forgive, but who are you to judge the others. I mean, I kid you not. This chapter is just rolling off my tongue. <laughs> it's exactly, exactly what I'm talking about earlier. You can't boast and cause divisions and slander and have hate, envy, jealousy in your heart and go and try to think that you could go and teach the Torah and be righteous in doing so. You cannot do both. And as Mashiach says in Matthew 18, 15, moreover, if thy brother shall transgress against thee. So first and foremost, this is even if a brother transgress against thee. Sometimes it could just be jealousy and you just mad. But even if someone did you wrong and trespassed against thee, which means they sinned against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if you're doing it in a righteous way, and he hears thee, thou hast gained a brother. But if you're going to do it publicly, and, it, and it's going to cause a mess and division, you really think that brother's going to hear you if you are doing it spitefully and trying to boast and, and make him uh, sound less amongst other brethren, you really think they're going to hear that as well as you going to them and saying, hey, you said this or you did this. Let me show you why I feel offended. Or even if it's not against me, you didn't trespass against me. You trespassed against Abba. Let me show you what you're doing. Instead of going in the comments, a video, in person, out loud, telling people that this person is a piece of crap because he's breaking this commandment, and you're not even giving, you're not even trying to tell him what he did wrong. Well, why don't you actually reach out and try to correct his his ways? But you're you're boastful about it, you're prideful about it. Power in the tongue. All right. Verse 13. And now, do you say today or tomorrow we want to go to that place or to this city and we want to stay there one year and do business and make profit while you do not even know that it is that know what is able to happen tomorrow? For what are your lives? Is it not a wind for a little time and afterwards it goes away? But you should say, if Haya wants and we are alive, we want to do this. AKA, as we say in our time, Abba willing, Abba willing, we will do this in his name and we will walk in his name and etc. Verse 16, but now you boast in your pride. This leads to evil for whosoever knows to do good and does not do it for him. It will be reckoned as sin. Whew. When you know better, you do better. That's why people ask like just random things like Jesus. People say, oh, is it a bad thing to say Jesus? 
when you come to the realization that that is a pagan name and has nothing to do with the original name, when you are using it in a daily format, when you're talking to Abba and all of that, like, yeah, like, you know, that's not his name. And you know that that honestly was put here as a stumbling block. When you know better, you do better. But when, but is there a format to use it? Absolutely. If you're trying to relate and talk the gospel to a Christian and you're not trying to talk over their head, there is formats to use that. You can say Jesus, Jesus, this. But in your own time, talking with brothers that know better, why would we continue doing that when we know that they put that out there so we wouldn't be calling on his name and searching the Hebrew to like to really think that Jesus would be a name of a Hebrew. Come on, man. Like, come on. Come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Especially the Hebrew of Hebrews, the Mashiach. It's like, come on. When you know better, simply do better. And that is chapter four. Chapter five, the final chapter of this reading. Let's get it on. And now, O oh rich ones, cry out and weep about the evil that will come upon you. Your riches are rotten and your clothes became food as for the moth and your silver and your gold will rust. And this will be a witness against you and it will eat your flesh as fire does for you will take riches in the last days. Look, the payment of the laborers that remains will with you overnight cries out before me and their outcries have come before the ears of ha adon shavot and you have had the desires of this world and they rejoiced at the sound of a flute and you declared the righteous guilty and killed him and he did not protest against you therefore beloved brothers you must have hope because of the future coming of the Adon. See, the owner of the field awaits for the fruits of the earth, and his hope is on the early rain and the latter rain. And also you, make your heart strong, for the future coming of the Adon is near. Do not sigh against one another. Listen up. This is us. This is us. This is a message to us right now. Do not sigh against one another, beloved brothers and sisters, that you do not come under control of a snare, for the judge is standing before the door. Beloved brothers, take as a parable for yourselves the sufferings and the endurance of the prophets who spoke to you in the name of the Adon. Look, we commend those who endure. For you have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the end goal of the Adon. For Hadan is Allahim of mercies, in great of steadfast love. But first of all, beloved brothers, you must not swear, not by the heavens or by the earth or by any oath, but let your words be yes, yes, and no, no, in order that you do not stumble. As Mashiach says, he's, he's, he's almost quoting Messiah verbatim here. Messiah says, Matthew 5, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, 
for it is Allahim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these committeth, cometh of evil. Yea, yea, and nay, nay. And so this goes in line also with um, fraternities, sororities, Freemasonry, any type of oath. So we go back up. Do, do not make a swear by any oath. It's a trap. And going into the Septuagint in Deuteronomy 23, 18. Uh... Let's go to back half here. Here we go. And there shall not be an initiated person of the sons of Israel. An initiated person. Someone that has taken an oath that is not of Abba. Scripture is very consistent with that. But the same people that are in these groups will say that, oh, yeah, I believe in the Bible. I'm a Christian or whatever they want to call themselves. But right here in the book of James and with Messiah in, in Matthew 5, he's telling you to don't do those things. But they do it anyway. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, kind of exactly. The Pledge of Allegiance, they got us there, huh? Yes, yep. For those that have to do an oath, all of the jobs that you have to do an oath from if the, the, those that's in the medical field, police, military, and man, I, I know from one myself, I was in the military, and you have to raise your right hand, say this little speech, and you are making an oath straight up to do whatever the heck they tell you and to die for this country. Yes, the Hippocratic Oath in the medical field, all of these, every single one of these pledges, oaths, we have been warned in scripture, but does anybody actually read and follow it? Evidently not, because most people that have done that, including myself, would would have would have said that I would have followed the Bible at that time. And this is in the New Testament, by the way. We have to stay vigilant. That's what that verse in in Peter is speaking about when it says, "Stay vigilant, so your adversary." is as a lion ready to devour his prey. Stay sober and vigilant. So it means pay attention. People think that means being sober and vigilant means, oh, don't get drunk or, oh, no, this ain't talking about drugs. We use sober and drugs and, re no, when he say, say sober and vigilant, stay clear-minded and aware of what you're doing because the adversary, the devil, is as a lion ready to devour you. He's going to catch you when you're not on your game. If you're not read up, he's going to make you say an oath, and then he's going to giggle his way all the way back to heaven and be like, see, I got him. He did the oath. No, no, no. Marriage vows are biblical. We're talking about unbiblical things, and, and that's not like an oath of that you're, uh, we're talking about oaths that are ordained of this world or a swear by heaven. You committing to your spouse, that's totally different and that's biblical.
All right. Verse 13. And if one among you endures something, he must pray. And if one among you is with goodness of heart, that one must sing songs. If And if one is sick, he must call the elders of the assembly to him, and they must do a prayer for him and anoint him with oil in the name of Ha'adon. And the prayer of the faith will support the sick one, and Ha'adon will raise him up, and if he has sinned, he will forgive him the sins. And let them confess their sins one to another, and let everyone do a prayer for his fellow. For Hayah is close to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. So if you truly want to be healed and you need support, we are here in fellowship, y'all. We are here in fellowship. And let me say this now. If you're not even comfortable confessing your sins to everyone, but you still need to be prayed for, and you're comfortable with sisters, brothers, or you want to come to me, this is what we're called to do. If you are struggling, humble yourself. It's okay that you're struggling. Confess it to a brother or to a sister and ask for prayers. This is ordained and you will be uplifted by other people that maybe are struggling and they are obedient and Abba listens to his children that are doing his will and are listening to his call. You definitely want brothers and sisters in your corner when you are struggling. If you are refusing to confess your sins, this isn't like what they do in the confessional and in the Catholic church. No, you're coming to brothers and sisters to be uplifted because when two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. And that's what you're doing here. You're calling on two or three, at least brothers and sisters to uplift you when you are struggling. That's what this life is about. He wants us to be a spiritual family, a body of Messiah. Verse 17, and also Elijah, the prophet was a man just like us. And he did a prayer that rain should not come and rain did not come on the land three and a half days. And before I turn the page, let's, let's remember this, y'all. We read about the great things that Enoch, Moses, Elijah, so many prophets and righteous people people of the scriptures do in the name of our heavenly father in the name of our Mashiach. And remember, they were, they were just a man like us. The only thing that they had was probably more faith. <laughs> faith the size of a mustard seed, right? Do not downplay the, the power of prayer when faith and obedience is attached to it. And also, just for um, context, this is referring to in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 with Elijah praying for uh, it not to rain. And then afterwards, he did a prayer that rain should come Ver, uh, chapter 18 in first Kings. So the heavens gave their waters and the earth her fruit. Brothers, if one among you goes from the good way to the evil and someone restrains him, corrects him, and know that whosoever turns him back from his wickedness, he will deliver a life from the death and make atonement for many sins. Yes, and that is how the book of Yaakov, the book of James, ends 
with the reminder that we are the messengers. We are the disciples that has been called upon to restrain and to correct our brothers. But if we don't do it in a righteous, humbling manner, we could turn them away. For myself, I pray to always, I know sometimes I could be hard and sometimes it's need, it needs be to be hard on folks because some are just lazy or just don't want to hear it nicely. I got to smack them in the face a little bit. Like, like when Messiah called Peter Satan, had to let him know that, hey, hey, snap out of it. I'm here to do the most high's will, not to be your best friend forever. And in, in this life, we still got to make sure that we uh, walk humbly in a meekly manner and that we pray to be accounted worthy because we're no better than anybody else. And that being said, I pray that this was a blessing in one of my favorite books, the book of Yaakov, that this will strengthen your walk and remind you of vital lessons that is given throughout the scriptures that James reminds us throughout this reading. Thank you to our brother Yaakov for this book. And once again, Shabbat Shalom to each and every one of you.